Okay, I think I'm in the right place now. Hello, everybody. This is Brian White from Yopon Brothers. Uh, hope you can hear me and see me. I don't really know because I'm kind of new at this Facebook Live thing, but uh, if you can see me and hear me, give me a comment or some type of affirmation, pep talk or something. Um, let me make sure I'm in the right place here. Get started in just a second. Hello, hi, thanks for joining us. Uh, and just let me get my bearings here and we'll get going. Uh, if you can't hear me or see me, just let me know and I will fix it, do my best to fix it. Okay, so I posted earlier on the um, on the page that there is a slideshow available. So if you would like to see the slideshow, just go ahead and click on that link, and it will be kind of like a little not so great picture, but it it's good enough. You can follow along with us uh, if you like, and if you don't want to follow with a slideshow, you certainly don't have to. I can blab all night long, no problem there. Um, so for those of you who uh, weren't here when we started for that five minutes of awkward silence while I figured out how to do this, uh, my name is Brian White. I'm the CEO of Yopon Brothers American Tea, and we are a tea propagation and processing firm in Edgewater in New Smyrna Beach, Florida, and we make tea out of Yopon Holly. So I know this audience probably is really innately familiar with what Yopon Holly is, but it's a really popular native uh, plant species and uh, really popular used in ornamental landscaping. But it's also our only caffeinated plant species native not only here to Florida but to the entire United States and most of North America, by the way. Uh, so for those of you following along with the presentation that want to look at the slideshow, um, it is in the feed uh, maybe earlier today. I posted a link and you can look at that slideshow and actually click through it as we go. And if you don't want to, that's okay. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, once again, Brian White, CEO of Yopon Brothers, and we're located in Volusia County. So uh, the first thing I usually start with is uh, what Yopon is. We say, what the heck is Yopon? Because nobody ever knows. With this crowd, probably not the case. I think most people here know what Yopon is. Um, it's been known as a lot of different uh, names all throughout its history. So you have the Asi, you have Casina, you have uh, Yopon, it was called the Black Drink, the Purifier, has lots of different uh, terminology all throughout its really long history as a native food and medicine. I won't spend too much time on that because I think this is a plant conscious crowd and I don't have to really explain too much about what Yopon is. Uh, but it is America's only caffeinated plant species, which makes it really commercially important. Um, and it's also native to the southeast U.S. It's related to yerba mate. So yerba mate is a important economic crop in South America that is related to yopon. It's also caffeinated. It's also a holly. That's Ilex paraguensis. And yerba mate is worth about a billion dollars a year um, in Argentina, Paraguay and Brazil, where it grows naturally. Uh, yerba mate has been basically extirpated in the wild. There's very little wild uh, yerba mate remaining, and uh, we certainly don't want to see that happen with yopon. But for anybody that's familiar with yopon, not very likely. It's a pretty resilient species. It is an ilex, so it is in the holly family, 
Uh, it's really common in the landscape business. It's a popular ornamental shrub. It's got pretty berries in the wintertime. Birds and bees like it. Um, the male cultivars that are more, mostly dwarves um, stay small. And they don't get berries. And they're kind of like the southern version of a boxwood. Yopon's also extremely rich in, tan, in um, antioxidants, rather. So it's right on par with tea as far as what the health benefits are like. It's got a lot of caffeine. It's rich in antioxidants. But one major difference between yopon and tea is that yopon does not have a lot of tannin. So it's not bitter. It's really mellow tasting, uh, which makes it kind of attractive to people who uh, can't handle the tannic bitterness of tea. Historically, uh, in the American South, it has been used as a tea or an herbal tisane. Food, medicine had really important ceremonial usage, which we'll get to in a little bit. Oop. Um, so if you look at the slideshow, you can see where Yopon's native range lies. It grows in, all throughout the American Southeast. It is endemic to the American Southeast, so it doesn't grow anywhere else. Um, some people say there's a disjunct population in Chiapas in southern Mexico. I don't know if that's true or not. Never been to Chiapas, uh, but that's what some people say. So it, it likes to grow in all sorts of um, habitats and conditions. It likes maritime hammocks. That's primarily where our yopon comes from. Piney flatwoods. It also grows really near um, the coast and is common all the way up to the dune line here in Volusia County. So it's extremely salt tolerant tolerates a wide range of growing conditions. And of course, it was known historically as the black drink. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with that, it was um, ethnobotanically, it was used as a ceremonial purifier. So yopon was um, consumed as a food, a medicine, and also as a ceremonial, ceremonially important drink as well. A uh, colonist called it the black drink or the white drink. The Timucua called it Casina. That's here in central Florida. And further north, the, the Muscogee or Creek tribes called it, um, called it Aussie. Aussie, which means the black drink. There's a picture here that if you're following the slideshow, uh, does show some historical engravings of the Yopan tribe. Or not Yopan tribe, but uh, Timucua tribe. And they're actually preparing black drink in all of these photographs, or I'm sorry, etchings. They're probably not historically accurate, by the way. You know, most of these drawings that were done by colonists or European colonizers are kind of embellished or romanticized in some way. But they do depict uh, the importance of black drink or yopon to these indigenous tribes. By the way, guys, uh, don't feel afraid to leave me a comment. That way I know that I'm you know, not boring you to death or uh, if you want me to stop and answer some questions or clarify anything just let me know. But let me know that you can see me. I'm always concerned about that. This is like super technologically out of my uh, comfort zone. So anyway, I'm going to continue on here. Um, Yopon was consumed by humans for at least 8,000 years, probably longer. There are all sorts and manners of indigenous tribes that used it as a food and as a medicine. Uh, those include the Timucua, which were here in central and north Florida and southern Georgia. Uh, the Muscogees, also known as Creeks, they were common all throughout the uh, rest of the Southeast, so Alabama, Georgia mainly. Um, the Seminole, which are a offshoot of the Muscogee, consumed it as well. And the Catawba uh, in Choctaw also consumed Yopon. There's a lot more as well. So even all the way up toward the Carolinas and the Appalachians, the Cherokee, um, cultivated yopon actually outside of its native range, so it's pretty interesting. Uh, for those of you that can't see uh, the slideshow, there's a picture of this guy who was a famous Seminole war chief, and uh, his name is Osceola. And for those of you that don't know, uh, his name is a transliteration of Asi, which is the Creek word for yopon, and Yehola, which is the Creek word for shouter or crier. So um, he is really the black drink shouter. Osceola, kind of a seminal figure here in um, Florida, really important uh, war chieftain, uh, maybe in the 1830s, early 1800s. 
Uh, if you're following along in the slideshow presentation, there is a picture of an archaeological dig. And that is the Wendover Archaeological Site, which is located in Titusville in Brevard County. It was uncovered by a real estate developer in 1982. And the reason why we talk about Wendover is because, um, and I don't like to usually refer to developers as being the good guy, but he was a good guy in this case because he was digging a swale mm -hmm. or retention pond. And um, oh, hold on, some people are having problems with the meeting here. Let me see if I can fix this real quick. Doo -doo. Okay, is everybody in? Okay, some people are here, some people are having problems. Oh man, we're having technical difficulties. So many people are saying hello. Hello, hello, hello. I got 15 people, 15 eyes on me. Is that good? I'm gonna keep going. All right. It's very awkward watching myself. Okay, back to my bearings here. Okay, so we were talking about Wendover, the Wendover Archaeological Site, and the importance behind that is to demonstrate how long indigenous people actually lived here in Central Florida. So what happened was a developer was creating a housing development. Yeah, you know, our favorite people in the native plant community. Uh, but this guy was creating a housing development back in 1982 in Titusville area. And he was digging a retention pond or a swale and he, you know, the bucket comes down in the front end loader and it comes back up and there's a bunch of human skulls and remains and stuff in it. And he goes, uh oh, that's not good. You know, I got to call the authorities on this. He didn't know what happened. The state came out, surveyed the site, uh, determined that they were indigenous people and they had probably been there maybe 600 years or so. Uh, for some reason, this developer had a hunch that that wasn't the case. And eventually, I think it was USF, University of South Florida, came over to the site and they determined that the uh, human remains had been in this bog or the swamp for between six and eight thousand years. Mm -hmm. And of course, they found um, Yopon residue in some of these burial sites. So if you want to read up on the um, the Wendover archaeological site, it's really, really interesting. But it's a good demonstration for us to show how long indigenous communities existed here in Florida. A lot of people forget that, you know, for 8,000 years or more, there were hundreds of thousands or more indigenous people living in peninsular Florida. And they had um, native food systems that, that they used to survive for all that time. And Yopon was part of that native food system and it was a cornerstone of their civilization. So if you wanna read more about that, uh, there's a good book about it. I think it's called Bones and Windover, uh, but it's, it's great. Um, there's another picture here if you're following around in the slideshow, and what it is is a uh, carved out lightning whelk shell. So lightning whelk shells and other big kind of conquer um, whelk shells were used by native people uh, to consume yopon or the black drink in a ceremonial fashion. So some of these had elaborate carvings, they were really cool, and occasionally archaeologists or um, enthusiasts still find these remains all throughout Florida. Kind of a neat thing. So uh, traditionally yopon was used as a food and beverage. Uh, it was consumed in a ceremonial way, you know, kind of a um, kind of a uh, boiled concentrated dark liquid that was considered a ceremonial purifier, but it was also used on the regular, kind of like how we would use uh, tea or coffee today. You know, we might drink a, a weaker version and that was common as well. It was also used as a medicine. Um, in the Wendover site, the re human remains that were found that had injuries or signs of sickness or disease, some of them also had uh, yopon residue located near their remains, which was indicative that it was being um, administered as some type of a medication. It was also a valued trade commodity. So they have found yopon in the ruins at Cahokia, which is a kind of a famous archaeological site that is near modern-day St. Louis. 
and that's hundreds of miles outside of the native range of Yopon. So it had high value. It was traded widely all throughout um, North America. And a lot of people think, you know, native people were these very primitive backwater folks who were living in teepees and just kind of hanging out. But in reality, uh, they had complex civilizations and very well established trade routes and Yopan was very high value commodity being traded on those routes. And uh, last but not least, certainly, it was also a ceremonial purifier. So um, indigenous people, certain tribes of indigenous people, the Timucua included, had this lovely ritual in which they would consume as much Yopan as they possibly could. Usually that really thickly concentrated black drink Yopan and then they would throw up everywhere. And that's why it has the lovely botanical name Ilex vomitoria. And if you're looking at the slideshow, uh, it has like a gross a girl giving a gross expression and also a engraving of a Timucua warrior vomiting. Uh, so it's like, hey, why do we have this gross name for Yopan, this Ilex vomitoria? It's definitely a marketing hurdle for us. You know, we have to explain why uh, Yopan has the name Ilex vomitoria. And that brings us to Carl Linnaeus. So Linnaeus gave Yopan its original name. You know, he was kind of like the man created binomial nomenclature. And I'm certainly not going to lecture uh, a bunch of native plant folks on plants because you probably know more about Carl Linnaeus than I do. Uh, but what I can tell you is that he named Yopan Ilex Cassine, and this is in the 1750s. So he let it keep its indigenous heritage. Um, Cassina was the Timucua word for Yopan. Uh, he let it keep the Cassina and also the Asi, which was the Muscogee word. And he just kind of said, well, that's what they call it. So that's what we're going to call it too. And uh, gave it that nice name. But that didn't last um, because a lot of things were happening at that time. Yopan was kind of common in the North American realm at the moment. Um, with indigenous people, but indigenous people were kind of fading away. Uh, colonial people were consuming it, and it was also f showing up on the street in Great Britain and Europe. Uh, in Great Britain, it was known as South Sea Tea, and it was showing up in commerce. So we had our own Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Carolina, Yopan leaves showing up in on the streets of London in the mid-1700s. Uh, it was showing up in France, where it was known as Appalachine, and it uh, was present in Spain where it kept its kind of indigenous name, which was Casina. So it had been traded domestically for a long time before that. Also at the same time uh, in this time period, which is between the 1750s and 1780s, uh, indigenous populations in North America were bottoming out. So there was a really precipitous decline in indigenous communities and the number of indigenous people in North America. So their customs declined. They uh, lost numbers and all of their customs and all the things that they did kind of went away and people forgot about them. So that was happening at the same time uh, in between Linnaeus and this other chap um, who if you're following the slideshow, you'll see his picture. He's kind of a portly guy. We'll get to him in a second. Uh, also at the same time in Great Britain, you had King George uh, III who was kind of saltacious towards Americans. He just got his butt kicked in the Revolutionary War, lost over 20,000 soldiers, and um, was not too fond of the colonists or the new Americans at that time. And Yopan was coming from North America or from America. Uh, we also had this little gimmick called the Boston Tea Party a few years before that, where we dumped all their tea into the ocean. And that was to protest uh, taxes, tariffs on tea. Um, so King George at that point in time earned as much as 10% of his revenue from duties on tea, which came mostly from China, and it was controlled by the British East India Company. Uh, our business partner, Mark, knows a lot more about the opium wars and the British East India Company than I do, but it's just suffice to say that they were really nasty folks who did a lot of really horrible things all over the world, and one of the horrible things they did happens to be quashing Yopan. And uh, the reason why they did that is because a lot of their money came from tea. Up to upwards of 70% uh, of their revenue came from the tea trade. And Yopan was showing up and it was providing a lot of the same benefits as tea. It was caffeinated. 
It was uh, rich in antioxidants, tasted good. Uh, it didn't have the tannin that tea has, so you didn't need to sweeten it. It wasn't bitter. And uh, people really liked it, and it was showing up on the street in Great Britain. And it was coming from a land that was no longer under the control of the British crown. So they couldn't really curtail uh, its importation into Great Britain anymore. So it was a threat. It was cutting in on their action. And the end result is, hey, it's time for a rebrand. And in this time, this is like 1789, uh, the royal botanist at Kew, William Eiton, renamed Yopan from Ilex cassinae to Ilex vomitoria. Uh, no one really knows exactly why that had to happen, um, but uh, some people, including Dr. Putz at University of Florida, says he, they believe that William Eiton was in the employ of Ceylon tea merchants, read the uh, British East India Company. And like I said before, Yopan was cutting in on their turf, on their action. It was taking their uh, revenue away that they earned from tea that came from further away in China or the Indian subcontinent, and it was time to rebrand it. So basically what they did was make a marketing decision. So Yopan uh, was rebranded into Ilex Vomitoria, and they gave consumers a choice. You could either drink the beautiful, elegant queen's tea from faraway exotic lands, or you could drink the treasonous American savage tea that makes you throw up everywhere. Uh, so you can see how that turned out. It was a brilliant smear campaign that really damaged the Yopan industry for hundreds of years. And uh, shortly after that time, Yopan really began to fade into obscurity. And it kind of remained in the dustbin of history for hundreds of years until now, really. And it came back a few times um, during the Civil War. The southern ports were blockaded by Union gunships. Uh, people really liked coffee at that time, and they couldn't get it. So what do they do when they can't get their coffee? Well, they found another caffeine source. Everything old is new again, and they drank Yopan. Uh, it happened again during the Great Depression, uh, which hit the South extremely hard, especially here in Florida. And people were eating things like sandhill cranes. And what do you need to wash down your sandhill crane? You need some Yopan, I guess. So it's had a couple resurgences. Most of the time, they were short-lived. Um, a couple times, they uh, were a little bit, had a little more clout. Um, during the 1920s, the USDA tried to bring Yopan back. They featured it in the World's Fair. It didn't work out. And it just kind of remained in the dustbin of history. And I think that's because... Yopan earned this connotation uh, stemming from the British smear campaign, which made people think it was kind of a poor person's, you know, peasant beverage. It was not fashionable to drink Yopan. It was, you know, something that poor people did. So people didn't want to associate with that um, idea. So they drank tea or coffee instead or other things. So Yopan spent about 200 years in the dark, uh, but a resurgence is at hand. And a big reason for that, if you're following along the slideshow, is the decline and destruction of the Florida citrus industry. So if you're familiar with citrus, you know that it's a non-native monoculture that is also an $8 billion a year cash crop here in Florida, or was. Um, at one time, it employed 80 to 100,000 people. But the industry has been absolutely decimated in the last decade by a bacterial disease called HLB. That's Huang Long Bing. Uh, it's a bacterial disease that is vectored by a little bug called a citrus psyllid louse. And the psyllid came over on probably shipping material from Asia and China um, a long time ago. So maybe 1990 or maybe even earlier. But since that time, it's spread all throughout Florida's citrus producing regions. And it's just had a devastating effect on the industry. It started out in Miami-Dade County and kind of spread from there. Um, but once a tree is infected with HLB, there's really no cure and there's no way to make the tree economically viable uh, enough to produce a crop that the growers can make money off of. So the result has been billions and billions of dollars lost and vaporized from Florida's economy and up to 40,000 jobs have been lost as well. And that's not over. And the industry loses about 15% of its volume year over year. So it's just really a devastating situation um, for citrus. And in the last 15 years, the citrus industry has 
declined by 60%. So we're at the lowest Florida citrus producing, producing levels in 60 years. So it's really been a devastating situation for citrus. Uh, there are other crops that are grown in Florida that have been a little bit more successful recently. Uh, one of them are blueberries. So blueberries have done very well. Started growing them here in large numbers in the 90s. Um, back then, I think it was about 2 million pounds a year that Florida was producing. And uh, up to a couple of years ago, that was over 30 million pounds. So blueberries have been really uh, well producing crops for Florida farmers, but they have a, a different problem and it's not really a biological problem, it's an economic problem. So uh, for a long time, the cultivars of blueberries that are being grown in Florida were unique to Florida growers or they were grown under license or whatever, and a lot of those have expired. And now what you have are growers in Mexico and Georgia and other states and other countries growing the same fruit in the same season for a third of the price. Uh, so a lot of Florida blueberry growers just have a hard time competing with that. And when you drive around, you see a lot of the you pick farms, and that's because it's too expensive to even get uh, laborers to pick that fruit. So you've got to pick it yourself if you want it. And unfortunately, some of it ends up rotting on the trees. So people in Florida that grow crops are looking for alternatives, and we think native alternatives are a really good option for them. Uh, there's other crops that uh, this crowd probably <laughs> doesn't like very much, and uh, one of them is big sugar. And if you're reading the slide, you say it says big sugar, big problem. So we're not a fan of big sugar either, uh, but it's a huge industry. It employs about 12,000 people, mostly south of Lake Okeechobee. Um, we produce 200,000 tons of sugar a year in Florida. So it's a huge industry, uh, billions of dollars. It's very economically successful. It's an easy crop for them to grow, but it comes at a hugely devastating environmental price. Uh, so they're putting all sorts of inputs into that sugar crop, and those inputs, of course, invariably end up in our waterways, uh, which cause all the nasty uh, economic and environmental disasters that we see year over year, especially in our coastal communities. So if you're following along, there's a picture of some green nasty sludge that's like in the lagoon and also in a coastal waterway. And of course, that's caused by nutrient pollution. And I think most people here are familiar with that problem. Uh, but nutrient pollution, you know, is caused by runoff from not only agricultural industries, they certainly do share the blame, but a lot of it is just homes and yards and turf and golf courses and everybody putting all these inputs in to um, their landscape and into their crops. And when it rains or we have a, any type of weather event, all that stuff ends up uh, running off into our waterways where it causes these devastating algae blooms. And uh, in a state that is wholly dependent almost on tourism, the last thing that tourists want to see are, you know, 20 tons of dead fish on their beach caused by an algae bloom. And that's what we're seeing a lot of the time. So it's a huge problem. Of course, we have a successful sugar industry in, in South Florida, but it comes at a big price for the rest of us. And that's another reason why we say, hey, let's grow something native. We can create a demand for a native food product. Let's do it. Let's see what happens. Uh, outside of those industries, just agriculture in general in Florida, there are about 47,000 farms in the state. And that's millions and millions of acres that are under cultivation. Actually, it's about 10 million acres. And both the number of farms and the acreage involved are actually a reduction from just a couple of years ago. So that's the result of a lot of small farmers going out of business and mostly these big factory farms are taking over where they left off. And the net uh, commercial benefit to the state is about $8 billion from those other industries outside of citrus and sugarcane. So huge business, huge uh, amount of jobs and economic revenue at stake and also all of the environmental pollution that comes from that. So crazy stuff. Oops, there we go. Okay, so now we're gonna go, where does Yopon come in? We talked about the history of it, the black drink, uh, along with the indigenous communities that used to exist here in Florida, which are all gone by the way. Um, and we talked about the agricultural enterprises that are under assault from various maladies, both economic and environmental. And now we're going to talk about how Yopon can play a role in fixing all of that. 
So 150 million Americans or more drink tea every day. Um, tea being a beverage made from the leaves of the Camellia sinensis plant, which is the tea plant. It's naturally caffeinated. Uh, it's native to China. It grows in other places now. A lot of it comes from India. A lot of it comes from Sri Lanka. Uh, some of it comes from maybe far uh, Western Asia. But one place where it doesn't come from in very large numbers at all is the United States. So tea is very hard to grow in most places in the U.S. And uh, where it does grow, it's not very profitable and requires a lot of inputs. So 150 million Americans a day drink tea, whether it's iced or hot. And the segment, the tea segment uh, in the U.S. grows by about 8% a year across all demographics. So old people, young people, rich people, poor people, they're all drinking more tea. That's one common thread. Uh, we import into this country a quarter million tons of tea leaves every single year. Uh, most of it comes from Asia. So you have to think about how much carbon, how much fuel it takes to move a quarter million tons of anything across oceans uh, to get here. And that's what we're dealing with. So there's a huge uh, toll, huge carbon footprint associated with moving all of that tea from Asia to the U.S. Uh, it's also an obscure supply chain. So you really don't know where your tea comes from. You don't know who's producing it. A lot of these tea plantations are uh, run in kind of shady ways. They use child labor. Uh, they don't pay, pay fair wages. Um, they exploit native communities. And with Yopan, uh, you don't really get that. You know where it comes from. It comes from here. And OK, what makes Yopan something that people want to buy? Well, it's caffeinated. It's the only caffeinated plant species in the U.S., and it's the only caffeinated plant species in North America until you go down to southern Mexico where you find Theobroma, which is cacao, chocolate. That's the next closest caffeinated plant species to where Yopan grows. Um, it's beneficial for health and wellness-oriented consumers. It's really rich in antioxidants, like possibly in the top 20 antioxidant-containing plant species in the world. So it's really good for you. It uh, has a really pleasing taste and aroma. It's low in tannin, so it doesn't taste bitter like tea does, and you can't oversteep it. So you can steep it over and over and over again, and it won't uh, turn bitter on you. It's also what's considered these days to be a functional beverage. So it does things for you. It makes you feel better. It has health benefits, and that's really popular with American consumers these days. Is it profitable? Can people grow it? Well, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, the tea segment in America is worth $11 billion a year, and the local food segment, where tea never plays, is worth $18 billion. So Yopan kind of meets in a Venn diagram between both of those segments. So it absolutely is something that people want to buy. And I can't see my own notes here. Uh, so really for farmers, Yopan makes good sense because it can be profitable, or at least as profitable as citrus. And it requires a lot fewer inputs. Being a native plant species doesn't need the same amount of irrigation, pesticides, uh, fertilizer. It doesn't need any of that stuff to be healthy, to thrive, and to create a profit and a utility for these farmers. Um, it also gives farmers the opportunity to be good environmental stewards. And I think that a lot of farmers actually do want that. They don't get the opportunity to do it very often because so much of what they grow requires uh, very intensive inputs and, uh, and practices that are maybe not um, lead themselves to be good environmental stewards. But I think that farmers really do want that. I think a lot of business owners want that. And uh, at Yopan Brothers, we always reject the idea that um, you can't have a good business and a profitable business that also benefits the environment. I think that's a big crock of BS. And uh, we don't play that game here. So when we go to farmers, we do promote Yopan as a way for them to make money, create jobs, create economic opportunities, and also turn a profit for, the, for their businesses. Um, another thing is that it has an evolutionary advantage. Um, it is evolved to thrive in Florida's kind of sometimes harsh climate. It's drought tolerant. It's salt tolerant. It doesn't freeze. Uh, it doesn't need a lot of inputs. It tolerates a wide range of soil conditions. It's really easy to grow. So I think that that gives it kind of a leg up over other crops that farmers would want to cultivate. And maybe most importantly, consumers like it. 
Uh, University of Florida did a blind taste test with Yopon and they put it kind of did the Pepsi challenge with Yerba Mate and 100% of those that were surveyed preferred Yopon to Yerba Mate until they found out that it was called Ilex Vomitoria and then some of them changed their mind. So it goes to show you the power of that uh, marketing tool employed by the British Crown. And just to show you how much economic potential could take place in Florida if farmers start growing Yopon, if Yopon captured just 1% of the American tea market, we would need 5 million pounds of Yopon leaves a year just to fill that demand. So that goes to show you the scale of uh, this industry and what it could mean for Florida farmers and Florida citizens in general. You know, if you had a, a extremely sustainable native crop of Yopon being grown here in Florida, um, if farmers were growing Yopon instead of other things, it would, it would really be beneficial both economically and environmentally. Create a lot of jobs here. Uh, we have some strategic partnerships at Yopon Brothers that make what we do possible. We have a research partnership with UF and IFAS, and they um, kind of administer our pilot farms. We have about five pilot farms throughout North and Central Florida that are uh, cultivating Yopon trees. Uh, we also have a strategic partnership with AgriStarts, which is a very large propagation firm located in Apopka. They propagate all of our trees. If you're in Orlando, you're probably familiar with Foxtail Coffee. We provide 100% of the tea at Foxtail Coffee. So they have nine uh, standard tea blends and five of them are based in Yopon, which is just huge for us because you're talking maybe 5,000 cups, or I'm sorry, 50,000 cups of Yopon served every month in, at certain times of year at Foxtail Coffee. So it's a huge exposure point for us and a great way for us to glean feedback. And the feedback that we received is that people really like the taste of Yopon and they're willing to pay good money for it. Um, sec last but not least, uh, we help formulate the American Yopon Association, which is a nonprofit collective of Yopon producers all throughout the US. And it's kind of our mission there to uh, promote Yopon consumption widely all throughout the country and the world. Uh, so when we make our Yopon, it's a really simple process. Uh, it starts with harvesting. There is no mechanical way to harvest Yopon, so it's just really, really tough work, and it's all harvested by hand. Uh, the leaves are then washed and sanitized, and they go into a specialized piece of equipment called a withering rack, and it takes them about three to four days to dry out on that withering rack. Then they're processed and packaged for sale, and to date we've served over 700,000 cups of Yopon when you really break it down into a single serving. That's how many um, single servings we provided to date, approximately. Well, we have lots of cool products, and if you want to check out our website, yoponbrothers.com, you can see what some of them are. We have five mainline products um, on our, in our line. We have a new Revive Mint that we just released. It's really good. Uh, we have a lavender coconut and a fire roasted, which is kind of a homage to the way that um, native people consumed it. We also have just a standard green yopon and a Florida chai as well. So it's kind of our, our goal to make yopon broadly appealing to people that have, you know, varying tastes, a discerning palate. They can still enjoy um, yopon like they would any other tea. So kind of as a close, um, what we're really working to do here is to create sustainability, um, a sustainable ag industry here in Florida that revolves around a singular native plant species and maybe others too. You know, uh, people don't seem to remember this, but maybe a million native people lived on the Florida Peninsula a couple thousand years ago and they uh, were sub subsisted completely on a native food system. Um, so I think we need to take a look back at how they did it and see how we can create products from those native plants today that consumers will adopt and will pay money for and enjoy. And I think we've done that with Yopon and uh, just ba barely scratched the surface with native food rematriation and how that uh, can work to the benefit of farmers and citizens all throughout um, the world, really. And so that's a big part of what we do. Uh, another kind of big column for our business is environmental stewardship. So uh, we don't want to grow anything or make anything that is not sustainable and harms uh, the natural world around us. So very cognizant of that. And we go into um, every farm that we work with and say, hey, this is a big, a big important thing for us. You uh, need to sign on to that. And luckily they have. And 
we're a totally certified organic supply chain. So there's no fertilizers, no pesticides. Of course, people say GMO. There is no GMO Yopon, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, but building a supply chain from the ground up means that we can build an organic supply chain from the ground up. And the last thing is uh, food sovereignty or native food rematriation. So if you go on our website and you buy a canister of our tea, 5% of every sale goes to the North American Traditional and Indigenous Food Systems, which is a nonprofit based in Minneapolis. It was started by a Lakota Sioux chef named Sean Sherman, and he is uh, painstakingly recreating native cuisine from all over North America. So he uh, started working in restaurants as a classically trained chef. He's cooking Italian food and French cuisine and all this stuff, and he's going, well, or don't my people have cuisine or food that they've consumed for hundreds or thousands of years? And um, he really painstakingly recreated these uh, native recipes from tribal people all throughout North America. And it's a really cool program and project that we're, we're honored to be a part of. And that's basically it. So if you have any questions for me, um, I think you can just type them in here or make a comment. And I can make a comment too, and that way you can respond. I'm happy to be here and um, thank you all for watching. And hopefully this thing's working. I know somebody's got questions. Let me make sure it's all good here. Nobody? I was that good? Covered everything? Um, if you have any questions about uh, Yopon in general or you want to get more scientific about it, full disclosure, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I came from a law enforcement background, if you can believe it or not. I tell everybody I'm a recovering police officer. Um, but our website, which is yoponbrothers.com, actually has a fairly well put together research section. And there are lots of papers available for free. So things that you would normally have to pay to download, you don't have to pay to download them or print them out. You can just go on to our research section and um, go ahead and read them for yourself and form your own opinions about Yopon. So we don't shy away from the fact that, yes, uh, you can go into the woods and harvest your own Yopon and make your own Yopon. You can grow your own Yopon. And uh, we don't look at that as a threat at all. I mean, it's just a great way to spread awareness about Yopon is that, yeah, this is part of the natural environment around you. And this is something that people have used to their benefit for many thousands of years, and you can too. So if you ever have any questions about that or any questions for us, uh, feel free to drop us a line. Uh, check us out on social media. Uh, we're on Facebook, Yopon Brothers American Tea. We are um, on Instagram. Uh, at Yopon Tea, and our website is yoponbrothers.com. If you want to email me, my email address is brian at yoponbrothers.com, and I'll put that in here so you can check it out. All right, and here's our Instagram. Oops, can't multitask, sorry. <laughs> Oh, okay. People can't leave a comment. I don't know what the deal is with that. Um, I'll tell you what. If you would like to text me your comments, I will answer my. I will answer them. Um, that is my phone number, so that might be a, an easy way to fix it. Okay. So, uh, Colleen, I think Colleen had a comment. Okay, Colleen uh, wants to know if all Yopon is caffeinated. Yes, uh, all Yopon is caffeinated. It is variable, so it, it's growing in nature, you know, and it's dependent upon lots of things like the uh, amount of rainfall we receive in a year or how much sunlight the plant receives or um, how much nitrogen is in the soil is a big indicator of the caffeine content of Yopon. So, it can have a lot of caffeine, like up to 60 milligrams per cup, or it can have very little. It varies from plant to plant and from year to year. But generally speaking, as a rule of thumb, all Yopon is caffeinated. Um, and that's just the cool thing about it, I think. Uh, 
one important thing to know if you're sensitive to caffeine is that the structure of those alkaloids, which is our methylxanthine alkaloids, it's different in yopon than it would be in the tea plant or in the coffee plant. Uh, most people say they don't have a jitters or a crash from yopon. It's a gentler, more mental acuity boosting caffeine buzz. So hopefully that helps. And um, if anybody has any other comments or questions, feel free to text me, 386-566-3826. Uh, I noticed that you can't leave a comment. I don't know why, um, but I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, okay, somebody wants to know if we can make tea from fresh undried leaves. I would say no. Um, you want to dry the leaves out, which you can either do with heat or time. So you can just put them in the sun inside um, and just leave them for a couple days and they'll dry out. You can roast them in a pan or an oven for a few minutes and um, that will dry them out and then you can make your own tea from that. I would not make them from fresh or undried leaves just because they won't steep. Uh, it, won't, it won't taste like anything. It won't do anything for you. Um, I'm sure you could use fresh or undried leaves in other applications, whether you're going to cook with them or maybe even juice them. I don't know, but they're not going to hurt you. I just don't think they're going to make a good tea. Uh, somebody else was asking if there are other stores in Central Florida that you can purchase Yopon Brothers from. Totally. Thank you for asking that. Shameless Commerce Division uh, it has been activated. So yes, uh, in Orlando area, you can purchase our teas at all Foxtail Coffee locations. You can drink them by the cup there or by a canister of the tea. There's 13 locations all throughout Central Florida. You can also purchase our tea at all World Market locations, which there are almost 300 all throughout the U.S. Uh, they were closed due to COVID-19. I don't know if they still are, but feel free to give that a try. Um, Dandelion Community Cafe in College Park, they carry it. Infusion Tea carries it. Um, Wild Hair and Longwood carries it. Lots of different retailers all throughout uh, Central Florida carry our products. So feel free to reach out to us uh, with any specific requests. Um, you can also find it on our website, which is yoponbrothers.com. So if anybody else has any questions, I'll hang out for a few. Uh, feel free to send me a text because the comment thing isn't working. I don't know why. Uh, but my number is 386-566-3826. I did put it in the comment section here. I'm not sure if you can see that. Um, but if you would like to ask me any questions, feel free. If you can't, uh, feel free to send me an email. That's brian, B-R-Y-O-N, at yoponbrothers.com. And I will be happy to um, answer any question that I can. So I want to say thank you uh, to Tarflower Chapter and Florida Native Plant Society. Mm -hmm. I am a Pawpaw member over here, so Volusia okay. County, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to all of you, and sorry if there were some technical glitches. Hope it was okay, and that I didn't put you to sleep or ruined your Cinco de Mayo. Uh, not like it wasn't ruined anyway, but uh, thanks for having me, and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.